to the Cities at Tufts Wednesday Colloquium, along with our partners Shareable and the Kresge Foundation. I'm Professor Julian Adjuman, and together with my research assistants, Perry Scheinbaum and Caitlin McLennan, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative, which recognizes Tufts as a leader in urban studies, urban planning and sustainability issues. We'd like to acknowledge that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts territory. Today, we are beyond delighted to welcome 2008 UEP alumna Melissa Peters, AICP. Melissa is the Director of Community Planning for the Community Development Department of the City of Cambridge. In her position, she manages a group of planners and urban designers responsible for long range planning with a focus on comprehensive neighborhood and open space planning. Melissa previously worked for CDM Smith in Chicago and Boston, developing comprehensive neighborhood sustainability and climate change plans for municipalities nationwide. She's an award winning and passionate planner skilled in creating integrated urban solutions that balance goals of diverse planning disciplines. Her talk today is the new rules of planning engagement. I'm playing with that because it's, there's uh, brackets around the word planning. The new rules of planning engagement, restructuring planning processes to ensure inclusive decision making and equitable outcomes. Sounds like a UEP thesis, Melissa. And we'd like to give you a Zoom-tastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. As usual, microphones and video off, and please send questions through the chat function. Melissa. Great, thank you so much, Julian. It's so great to be here. Um, you can take the planner out of UEP, but you always have that thread of social justice and equity in all that we do. Um, so really excited to be here today. Um, let me share my screen. So before I dive into um, the topic at hand, I uh, wanted to give a little bit of background about myself. As Julian mentioned, I graduated in 2008, so 13 years ago, and went to Tufts UEP um, as someone interested in environmental policy and planning and sustainability planning. I interned at the city of Cambridge um, from 2006 to 2008. I actually worked on the city's first greenhouse gas inventory and climate action plan. And from that experience, I was able to get my first job out of grad school at uh, a full service environmental engineering firm, CDM Smith, um, and worked there for about seven years doing um, environmental planning, infrastructure planning, um, a lot of environmental impact statements, climate change planning. And um, also got experience doing more sustainability and comprehensive planning um, during the 2008 Great Recession when some stimulus money came for uh, municipalities to do more broad-based planning. And it was that experience that really opened um, my, word to more, my world to more traditional land use planning um, and then was able to, to get that experience that ultimately um, brought me back to Cambridge um, in 2015, and I was hired to manage the city's comprehensive planning process in Vision Cambridge. Um, did, was in that role for about three years and then got promoted to director of community planning. And now um, my division kind of oversees all the long range planning for the city, um, citywide neighborhood and open space planning. And we have a team of about 10 uh, planners and urban designers. So excited to be here today to talk about practical steps planners can take to ensure planning processes listen to all community members um, and that decision-making results in equitable outcomes. So I wanted to do that by providing some um, real life Cambridge examples um, to give um, an overview of, of how this can be done in practice. Um, first, to kind of set the stage, um, I think this is not um, earth shattering, but these are typically what our public meetings look like. Um, it's not representative. Um, you'll see it's predominantly white male homeowners, older residents, and, and these people have um, a disproportionate um, voice in the city process. Um, they are socioeconomically advantaged, 
and they have a benefit in maintaining the status quo. And so, as you know, they are gonna propose changes that um, will help to undo some of the systemic inequities that we see in the built environment. Um, this chart that I show here on, on this slide um, comes from data that Boston University professors co uh, collected for their book, Neighborhood Defenders. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, and they cataloged who were the people that were coming to planning board and zoning board meetings and speaking at meetings. And you'll see in that first column, it was predominantly male, white, people over 50 and homeowners. And when you compare that to who our Cambridge population is, you'll see a significant disparity. Um, I think of, of, of note is um, we in Cambridge um, have a very young population. Our average, average age is 34. Um, and 75% of people at public meetings um, are over the age of 50 compared to 22% of the Cambridge population. Um, similarly for um, homeowners uh, represent renters, which are pred predominantly renters in Cambridge. And then of course, um, from sex and um, race as well. So we all know that the built environment is a product of white supremacy. Um, Amer Black and brown Americans are more likely to be struck and killed walking, are more likely not to own their home, suffer from transportation related air, air pollution. Um, and as we saw with the COVID-19 um, pandemic are more likely to have negative outcomes. Um, Cambridge is not immune to this. So I wanna provide a couple of um, data points on, on what this is like in Cambridge as well. Um, so this is a map of historic redlining districts and you can see also where current affordable housing locations are. So as a product of where we've zoned single family versus multifamily housing, we've kept um, affordable housing to certain parts of the city. You'll also see here that um, incomes and poverty rates are unequal across racial and ethnic uh, groups. Um, black and brown Americans um, make less and have higher po poverty rates than our uh, white Americans. And here you'll see that there's even climate inequities that result from this. So our lower income neighborhoods, um, which you can see by the pink um, boundary census tracts, um, those are more likely to have less tree canopy than our higher income neighborhoods um, in the yellow areas, um, which have higher tree canopy. Um, and a similar um, pattern is, is shown when we look at um, flood uh, risks as well. And also data from neighborhood defenders from Boston University professors. We know that the people who do come to meetings, we know they're not representative, but they also oppose development that could address issues that would um, help address some of these inequities. Um, so you'll see that white, um, uh, and homeowners are more likely to oppose multi-family housing compared to black renters um, who are more likely to be pro-development uh, in housing. So we, of course, you know, all planners and certainly the UEP lens has, has taught us to think about how we can restructure planning processes to ensure equity. So the planning process, I really wanna highlight all the different steps in the planning process. I think people, when they think process, they immediately think engagement and engagement of course is a huge component, but it's part of all of the planning processes. So I wanted to talk, I wanted to look specifically at each phase and think about the questions that we should be asking ourselves as planners um, and, and, and what's some examples in Cambridge of how we're starting to do that and, and recognizing that it's a journey and a, and a work in progress and we have a lot more work to do. So first in the pre-planning stage when you're organizing, you're figuring out what the problem is, who you need to engage with. It's so important to not define the problem yourself as the planner, but really listen to the communities and those especially who have been most impacted 
how they define the problem, because often it's not the same. Also, who who's typically engaged, who's not engaged, and what can we do to expand opportunities for engagement? And then as we move into the visioning phase, what are the desired results? What does equity look like? And can we come up with a set of core values and guiding principles that we can then use as metrics to evaluate our progress um, and the outcome that ultimately gets decided? Um, in my experience doing planning processes, it's really easy for people to agree on what's important to them. Um, diversity, equity, sustainability, livability. But when that translates into an actionable policy or program that could result in advancing equity, resiliency, sustainability, then people step back and say, oh, but we haven't considered this other issue. And so how can we really go back to those key things that we said were important to us um, and make sure that equity results in the end? Uh, data analysis. Um, data, as we all know, can be used um, for good and for bad. Um, really need to be mindful as planners and how we're using data and what that impact is uh, on people who have been marginalized. Um, what, you know, what data is missing? What does the data tell? What's the story behind the data? When we look at race and income, does the data tell us something different? In strategy development, um, when we're looking at different scenarios and alternatives, um, when we evaluate those, are we in taking into account who's burdened and benefit by the proposal? Um, what can we do to advance or mitigate unintended consequences? And then lastly, um, implementation um, and, and monitoring our progress, being accountable to what we said we would do and making sure that what we said we would do or the results that we wanted are actually coming to fruition. And if they're not, reevaluate based on our performance measures um, to make sure that those um, outcomes are equitable. So I wanted to give five different examples, um, just to, uh, to give you kind of an overview of the different things we're doing um, at the Community Planning Division at, at the City of Cambridge. And they each kind of highlight a different phase of that planning process. So the first is um, pre-planning stage, thinking about how we can hear those underheard voices. Um, and the city has developed a model. Um, it started in our Department of Human Services and now we've uh, adopted it at the Community Development Department and we're hoping to expand it to other departments. But to hire a team of outreach workers, the community engagement team, um, who are come from communities that we don't often hear from. And listening to them and having them tell staff how best we can reach out to their communities. So um, they provide representation and a voice on, on issues that's important to them. Um, we also develop um, grassroots leadership. Um, there's an image here of some outreach workers that we hired for the Envision Cambridge planning process, and two of them now have full-time jobs with the city. Um, and just creating that, um, that connection of who we can go to to talk about issues and, and treating those at the center of it as the experts and how best to reach their communities. So what they've told us is that the best way to reach their communities is in small group conversations, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, uh, surveys um, that are either written um, or verbal um, in their own languages. And the challenge that we've had is how do we then take that really intimate, um, deep conversation that we've had or in, in insights that we've gained from that and bring it back to the larger community um, and present it to make a decision that balances and considers all voices. And what we found in past processes is that when we would go back to the larger community meeting, when those people weren't represented and we say, well, we had focus groups or we heard from this community, the, the public would say, I wasn't at that meeting, or I've never heard that from any of my neighbors, and I, I talked to everybody, and they didn't believe us, um, and we struggled with, we're trying to reach this voice we don't hear, um, and when we're making a decision, people are 
assuming that the city is just has a top down, just they've already made the decision, they're just using this to justify the path forward. And so what we found is that we need to use technology to share what we've heard um, through quotes, video recordings, so that we aren't the ones going back and telling people what we heard, that the people themselves are, are telling that story. And that's so critically important. Um, the example I have on this slide is um, a tool, a relatively new tool called Cortico. I think it came out of the MIT Media Lab. Um, essentially is a, a AI transcription tool which takes uh, video recordings, could be of this Zoom session, and it um, highlights and categorizes all of the feedback, feedback that was heard according to themes. So if the issue of affordability came up or climate change, it captures all that and you can go in and you can highlight, uh, you can pull out and you can use that to help tell the story. The other thing that we're starting to do um, at the city of Cambridge is looking at all of our different engagement tools from surveys, focus groups, workshops, street teams, and making sure we're looking at it through an equity lens. So we, we have a team um, of, of staff who are really committed to this work who are assessing all of these tools and asking uh, questions to make sure that we can implement these in a more equitable manner. Um, we also are developing training through consultants on how staff can address issues of racism and white privilege and entitlement when we see it in public meetings and how to call it out and how important it is to call it out in action. Um, developing meeting codes of conduct with um, a, a group, an advisory board or neighborhood association that we meet regularly with and making sure they're on board with what they said was the communication agreement, how they're gonna treat others and that all voices are welcome. Uh, tips on how to run a, a, an inclusive meetings. These are all things that are so important um, in order to do as a planner. We, you know, we all know that we wear many hats, um, but we don't necessarily, aren't necessarily given the skills and the training to do that. And you, you get put into a public meeting and how do we equip our staff and able to respectfully and professionally uh, stand up for what's right um, and move the conversation in the right direction. Also, um, last to my last point on the slide, so important that we communicate to the public. Um, and by public, I, I mean the people who are, are the usual suspects at public meetings, that we're changing the way that we're doing decision making, that we're going through all these efforts to hear um, from all of our community, and that it's not what you hear at a council meeting is not necessarily the decision that's going to be made because we're going to factor in all these different methods um, and, and getting them to um, come to understand and to buy in on this new way of doing things. Um, next is an example of visioning. I wanted to talk about our neighborhood planning process. So for the last decade or so in Cambridge, we've been focusing on doing um, land use plans for our high growth areas, Kendall Square, North Point, uh, Alewife, uh, our, our major um, corridors and squares of Central. Now we're starting one on Cambridge Street. And that's so important because those are areas that they're expecting growth and change. And how do we wanna manage that change and result in, in positive outcomes? But what we've done is we've neglected um, the low growth areas, which are our primary residential neighborhoods. And it is true that there's not gonna be significant change happening in that area. But what we've lost is the ability to have that relationship with community members. And what we've decided is that we need to have an ongoing relationship with those people. And so we, um, are starting to have a different type of planning process. We're gonna continue our planning process for our mixed use districts and corridors that are experiencing um, you know, change in development, but then also have these planning processes that focus less on development, but more on community building, understanding their day-to-day -day issues, creating that positive um, and continuous relationship 
not only between city staff and the residents, but also having residents connect to one another. And again, this slide just emphasizes our, our goals for this process and how we, it really is about building relationships and networks. And one of the key ways that we're doing that is by making engagement and interactions more approachable, valuable, fun. Um, this example on the top right is um, a tool we used uh, for Envision Cambridge, the citywide plan. It was a, a, um, a land use map of the city of Cambridge um, and a table that people could, could mark up and we would ask different questions. And we heard from a lot of people we typically don't hear from in, in traditional public meetings. Um, we're also doing more community events, block parties, um, trying to connect neighbors to one another and building that relationship um, and then also connecting us to them. And so they, there's more of a relationship and we feel like we can be more proactive in our planning um, once we have those relationships set. Um, third, as an example of a data collection analysis, we've been applying an equity lens to our open space planning. Um, so how do we equitably distribute uh, our open space throughout the city? And typically open space needs assessments are, um, you know, there's a standard metric on open space um, per capita, uh, how, how much of the population is within a 10 minute uh, walk of a park and what that misses is all the uh, nuances of what access is. Access is not just physical, but also societal. Do people feel comfortable there? Um, is they, by a, you know, the way a, a crow flies, you might be within um, distance of a park, but maybe that park uh, you can't get to because of some physical barrier or maybe the parks that are nearest to you are all tot lots and your kids are teenagers. Um, so really looking at multiple lenses around access, but also looking at resiliency, how we all know that parks can serve as a major opportunity for um, combating climate risks, uh, flood protection, heat protection. How can we um, reprogram or uh, redesign our parks to, to give the benefits of climate resiliency, especially in, in neighborhoods who are more vulnerable? Um, which of course, as we know, co corresponds with um, our, our uh, um, on racial and, and income patterns as well. Um, and then also looking at you know, public health benefits um, and community benefits as well. So that's um, this slide, just the, the importance of applying that lens to those four categories. So what we did, is we looked at different metrics um, for each of those four categories. And we created a park access score, a health score, a resilience score, and a community score. And when we overlaid all those together by looking at age, ability, race, income, we were able to create this open space needs composite. And so this was a way to overlay equity issues on these different factors. And it's pretty telling, you, um, this the open space needs composite when you combine these is very different from any one of these alone. So you'll see here our park index uh, score, blue corresponds to high park need. Um, this area of the city by Porter Square, if you're familiar, kind of the middle section here, um, was in our previous open space needs assessment, considered the priority area. But when you look at all these other um, factors, that doesn't look so bad anymore. Um, it's actually more the east, eastern part of the city um, that has uh, open space needs according to these other factors. So rethinking how we can use data, thinking about what data is missing um, in order to, to really get it to the, the heart of the issue. Next, as an example um, of the strategy development planning phase, I wanted to talk about um, ways you can change the rules so that people don't have an outsized voice in the planning process. Um, so this is an example um, in Cambridge um, and anywhere, it's, it's 
it's really difficult to build affordable housing. It requires significant funding from federal and state sources and municipal contributions. In Cambridge in particular, there's high land costs, um, significant competition for market rate housing. Um, in certain parts of the city, you, you can't, um, you could, you know, it's an only zone for single family or two family, which continues that trend where all our multifamily housing is in certain parts of the city. Um, and then under the current system, um, it's a discretionary approval process. And it can be appealed, which results in delays, additional costs, and it's really hard for affordable housing developers to have confidence in, in, the, in the process and in what can be developed. And, and they're basically, their, their money is being put on hold and the financing on hold. Um, so we wanted to um, implement a policy solution that would address many of those challenges. So the affordable housing overlay was passed about two years ago now at the city. What it does is it um, has less restrictive standards for 100% affordable housing development than market rate housing. Um, so you can have higher um, density and height, um, you relief from other dimensional standards and parking. Um, so you can build more um, on the site if it's for 100% affordable housing than if it was for market development. And if you meet those new as of right zoning um, regulations, you don't have to go get a, a special permit or a BZA comprehensive permit. You, um, you can build as of right. Um, we're still requiring a design review, but it's non-binding and we have a set of guiding principles. Um, this, what this does is allows um, affordable housing development to happen in all parts of the city, not just where we've seen it, but it also doesn't hold up that money and it removes that permitting uncertainty. Um, so it makes affordable housing developer um, quicker and easier to build. And here's just an example of what um, the affordable housing overlay would look like in residential neighborhoods. Um, you could see this is um, on, the, on the left is an example of what you could build under current zoning, two units, two stories on about a 5,000 square foot lot. Um, with the overlay, um, really can fill out that, that lot, seven units, three stories. Um, and here's in one, one example, um, and then eight units, four stories in another. Um, and the, the point that we made in the public conversation is that these aren't, um, oftentimes people refer to neighborhood character um, and historic character and preservation when they oppose development, but 69% of the existing building stock in Cambridge is not zoning compliant. It could not be built today. Um, and there's examples of uh, mid-rise multifamily buildings in all of our housing districts, including our more single-family, two-family districts. So we see these as complementary and important in um, achieving our affordable housing goals. Lastly, um, is an example of implementation. Um, so important to um, implement the plan that you said you would implement um, and then monitor to ensure accountability. Um, so we, I mentioned the Envision Cambridge citywide planning process. Um, on an annual basis, we report how many of the actions um, that we said we would do are in progress, um, how many are finished, not started. We have a little report of why or why not. Um, and that's really important to, um, obviously for transparency in government, um, but to then also evaluate um, how we're doing. So we have a set of performance indicators across uh, six planning topics that are, are used to tell us if we're meeting our objectives that we laid out to. And if we're not, can we go back to those list of actions, revise, maybe do something differently, maybe start somewhere else and make sure that we're meeting our goals. So this next slide is just an example of, of one of, I think the 30 uh, performance indicators that we track. Um, this is our housing production goal by 2030. We wanna get an additional 12,500 new housing units in the city. Um, 
we started measuring it at the end of the envision planning process in 2018. Um, we've increased our housing supply and um, at the current rate, we are on track to reach our target by 2030. And so we're communicating this um, to the public. Um, we're hopeful, it hasn't happened yet, but we're hopeful to um, very shortly get our website um, um, up live and running that can be that communication platform to communicate progress and have accountability um, for city staff um, and city policymakers to say, hey, we said this was important to us. We're falling short. How can we do better? Um, and that's so important. Um, I wanted to um, end, if I have time, just with just with a, a brief question and discussion. So I have a, a current um, planning dilemma where I um, we just had a public process for a site that um, we were just needed to determine with the public um, the future land use. So it was decided that it would be affordable housing and we were having conversations with the public around, should it be rental, home ownership, what income levels it should um, serve, what communities it could serve, um, people with disabilities, seniors, LGBTQ friendly. And we went through the public process. We had larger community Zoom meetings. Um, we did some focus groups with our community engagement team. And for the most part, we got consensus on um, affordable housing. Um, the pretty much people had the same thoughts about uh, size and massing of the development, um, what amenities should be provided. Um, but the big distinction between um, the two communities was um, the larger public meeting, the abutters uh, and neighbors, um, they're all neighbors, but the um, abutting neighbors and homeowners, um, distinguished by homeowners, they wanted the site to be built as home ownership. And the uh, focus groups wanted the site um, to be rental. Um, and particularly they wanted it to be rental because they wanted it to serve people with the greatest need, people at lower incomes, and there's higher income thresholds for um, our home ownership program. And so now we're in this dilemma where we, we went out and we got feedback from people and now we don't have a clear outcome and we need to, um, we need to rec reconcile that. And I, I keep going back to the, pro the, the housing that this will help is for the people who were in the focus groups. And so really we should be listening more to them because they're the people that would benefit from it. But it certainly has raised a lot of questions about what the next step is, how to get the whole community on board and move forward. So I pose that if we have time in our question and answer period, I certainly would appreciate any of your guys' uh, feedback or insights on that. Uh, so with that, is close my presentation. I'll stop sharing. I am um, happy to answer any questions about the presentation, about my experience, um, welcome feedback on the question I posed. Great. Well, Melissa, thank you so much. It, it is, you know, for the faculty on uh, this, uh, this presentation, it's so pleasing to see, you know, the students, the alum, uh, and now the the consummate professional who's really thinking through um you know vital issues through the equity lens excellent presentation and we have of course lots of questions and um and and bear in mind also melissa's question that she posed uh, to to you but so tracy montgomery asks have you seen any ground up community planning efforts how does the city engage with communities who may be doing their own independent planning type efforts. Yeah, absolutely. And we welcome and encourage that. And <clears throat> I think a, a huge way to, you know, the city doesn't need to replicate um, and it certainly shouldn't replicate what it doesn't do particularly well. And so we need to rely on those community partners, those people that are experts um, in equity work, in the community work, um, and partner and work with them. And that's in part what the neighbor, new neighborhood planning model is, is really about. Right, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Anne Tucker. 
How do you manage to use plans and maps when many people in my community have real problems reading a 2D plan? Great, great question. Um, as we've been working with the community engagement team and we'll, we'll meet with them ahead of time and say, this is our planning problem or we wanna get feedback on this particular um, development or could be a, you know, installation of a bike lane or whatever it may be. And they'll, they'll stop us and say, everything you just presented, like that's not gonna fly. Like how, so we really have had to step back and, and tell, I, I personally think storytelling is the way to go. Um, you know, throw the map out, talk to people about what that means um, in their everyday life. Um, go off to the site with them, go for a walking tour, um, connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. I, I think that um, truly will be, uh, it, it takes more time, but I, I think that is ultimately um, the way to move forward. Great, thank you. Um... Wing Yu is asking, uh, have you used public participatory GIS as a way to collect data and voices to inform planning decisions? Sure, so I, I think by that you mean having like um, feedback on a, like a, a wiki map or um, is it, that with participatory GIS in this context? Well, let's ask Wing Yu, are you in the room still? Can you tell us what you exactly mean so Melissa can answer? Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Melissa. Um, yeah, I just mean uh, there's some methods that's been developed um, by a couple of universities around the world now um, to ask kind of the public, I suppose, or groups to collect data um, and then that get being mapped on the GIS, kind of like behavioral mapping, but kind of pu public participation behavioral mapping. So, you know, they might say what the favorite places are, what kind of times they use certain places, kind of like what Google's doing in a way um, in terms of activity times, but it could be easily mapped um, and analyzed later on. Yeah, good question. So partly what we did, um, we, we've definitely done that as a digital tool where people can go straight in and say like, this is um, an area of the city that I think is problematic, or this is the area that I love and why. But when I showed that picture of that um, mobile engagement station with the table of the city of Cambridge, people could write up on, we actually digitized all that analog data and had it in an interactive map so that we could show it um, in very um, illustratively what was coming up as themes in terms of what areas of the city um, so we've done that a lot. We also, um, we're starting to do more with, um, you know, I think with all of the data that's available, like tracking um, people's uh, cell phones um, or, you know, web data um, to kind of see where, especially a lot of the work that I do is around um, um, urban design and public space activation. So how do, can we compare activity of what's happening based on not only the use, but the design of um, the storefront or the facade. Um, and so we've been looking at that as well. Great, thanks, Melissa. We've got a statement here, but I think it's a really interesting statement from uh, an alumna, even before you, Melissa, Kathy Dalton, says, use very traditional organizing tactics to get the renters in the room with homeowners. Be transparent about this. Say this neighborhood has X percent renters. We want X percent renters in this meeting. And here's what we're doing to get them here. Uh, Kathy, do you want to make that a question or, or is it just a statement? It, it's a response to Melissa's question. Ah, OK. Um, which, I, which I followed on and said, you know, in, we used to do, we, we would do door knocking when, when it wasn't Zoom, offer people rides to the meeting, food, translation, childcare. Think about the barriers, the things that are preventing people from coming to the meeting. And a big barrier, and this is the hardest one to deal with in one way, is getting people who felt disenfranchised to the larger meetings because they have a previous belief and a well-established belief that their wishes aren't going to be heard. So you need to start making incremental change there or it's hard to make big change fast, but that's my answer to that. Thank you. Great advice. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Denise Caruzzi says Cambridge's work is so inspirational. There you go, Melissa. 
Uh, thanks, Denise, for that. Um, we have the Brown House Watch Party asking, um, oh, well, sorry, it's a response to your question, Melissa. How often are people from the majority community group, brackets homeowners, meeting with the people from the focus group? Is it possible for all community members to have a voice in their own planning compromise? Yeah, really, really good question. And I, if I think what you're asking is, can, can we bring the two groups together and have them um, have the discussion and understand you know, where they're coming from and maybe they come up with a, a compromise solution? I, I've, I've asked the same question and the counsel that I've been given from people who do this work and people from those um, underheard and marginalized communities is, um, no, that they don't, not, not at this time, they just don't feel comfortable for whatever reason. Um, and that's why they don't come to the larger public meetings because there are barriers and we have to one, build that capacity so that one day, hopefully in an idealized future that could happen. But I think at this point, it would be putting a lot on, um, it, it, I don't, I'm not sure it would be a safe space. Um, and I wouldn't feel comfortable putting people in that um, situation. Certainly others could have different opinions, but that's kind of where I, I'm thinking about on the topic right now. Great, thanks, Melissa. Michael Tomasoa asks, how did you use what you learned at UEP and the tools provided to help your career? Oh, um, and I think, the reason I chose UAEP um, and thankfully uh, was because it was so broad based and um, was really able to follow my interests, especially as they evolved. And I think just encouraging, um, you know, the social justice aspect of the work that threads through all of the different um, disciplines that people end up um, concentrating in. Um, and just a desire to, to help communities. I think that really distinguishes it between other planning schools, even in the area. So, um, uh, you know, we, we hire a lot of interns from the different planning schools. And um, I'll say you can, you can guess where people came just after meeting them for, for five minutes. Um, so it's, it's very telling. Um, great. Keep, uh, keep hiring uh, UEP uh, interns, Melissa. That's great. Um, Great question from Dewan, who I'm assuming is based in Toronto. Can planning be inclusive and equitable when more than 90% of city planners are white staff? Example, Toronto city planning staff is 97% white. That's a good question. I, I struggle with that personally in my profession um, as, as having someone with power and influence and a voice and um, knowing that I should be stepping back and um, letting you know people of color, people who have been underserved or marginalized and historically excluded step up. But at this, but at the same point, um, you know, I, I still I still assume this role and I can I, I can do what I can with while recognizing um, that I don't speak for anybody else, but I could still use my influence um, in that direction. But I, I think it is a problem. And I think, you know, we have to make the discipline um, more representative. I think that's a huge step in it. Great. I'm going to sort of riff on that uh, question from Duan. Um, after you'd left 2012, I wrote a paper with uh, Jess, uh, Jennifer Erickson, who was just graduating at the time. Uh, Jen now works for MAPC. And we, we were interested um, because all of the literature and the code of ethics of planners talked about social justice and equity, but none of it talked about cultural competency. And there's a big difference here. And so the point we were making is in our survey of accredited planning schools, not one, including Tufts, not one school had a class, a core curriculum class devoted to cultural competency. We thought this was quite interesting given that, you know, planners are increasingly working in cities of difference, increasing difference, increasing otherness. So the question I suppose is, is does cultural competency come up? Because if 
of Toronto planning staff are white, at least they could be culturally competent. You know, that would be a first step. Obviously, we want a diverse um, city planning, um, you know, department that reflects the community. But is cultural competency talked about much in Cambridge? Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that. We've as you can imagine, I've had a lot of conversations on this. Um, and there's kind of been two, two, par two parties um, over the mind. One of the mindset um, we need, you know, I, I think everyone come, is coming from it, at least those that I work with, my colleagues. Um, we need to make structural change and we, we need, we want to see change happen tomorrow and it's overdue. We can't perpetuate these inequities. Um, so so tell me how to do that and I'll do it. And and then there's, and I think everyone wants to do that, but there's people who, who kind of like, I don't want to skip to that step. And then there's, there's other people um, who are saying, we can't, even if we had the tools that we could give you to go do this work, you won't know how to use them if you don't believe in it, if you don't, understand it if you don't know where um you know people are coming from and so it's kind of working at how can you inc improve on um in at the individual level and um and the institution and then at the structural level and kind of there's almost um a step that you have to take before you can move on to the next one but you also have to do them consecutively so they're they're all right in essence but um I'm reminded I was speaking with, um, I'm blanking on her name, um, it'll come to me, but um, the former resilience officer for the city of Boston, who's now created her own firm, All Aces, she does this. Um, Tia Martin. Thank you, thank you. She, um, you know, I was saying, you know, there's this great, Seattle is a great case study, an example of, they did this racial equity toolkit, you know, a decade ago, and I've been implementing it. And, you know, can, you know, can't we just get that toolkit and start start doing it now? And and she had said what they had, she consulted with a lot of um, those folks. What they had found is if they would give this tool for municipal employer to do before filling out a, a budget proposal for a project and answer all these questions of who's burdened, who's hurt by this, um, who could be benefited, how could you change engagement? They they didn't, they weren't able to answer those questions until they had the cultural competency um, and base knowledge. So I think you're so right, Julian, that is so important. Yeah. Um, and it's something that we've started to do in staff training as well, because we can't be expected to do this work um, if we don't have that. And especially to, to their question of, you know, it's mostly white people in the room. Right, and, and just a, a point, uh, Anne Tucker, thank you for asking, sorry, what is cultural competency? My students actually prefer the term cultural humility. We, how do we interact with people who are culturally different to us? And not just racial and ethnic cultures, but, you know, sexual cultures. Um, again, we live in cities of difference. The splintering of identities into multiple identities how do we interact? How do we plan if we can't speak to people because we don't know the appropriate way? That's really what cultural competency is or cultural humility. Um, Joshua Dickens is asking, um, I don't know if I heard exactly how you and your teams have worked on measures um, for the effectiveness of your initiatives. For example, how many more voices representative of the community and number specifically are you hearing that you weren't hearing prior to the community engagement team? Uh, is that impact being sustained? Uh, how are you all measuring the effectiveness of the engagement teams? So multiple questions, but I think it's about measurement and effectiveness. Yeah, good questions. And I, I wish I had a good answer in that we haven't done a good job of quantifying that the results of our new engagement are attempts at uh, diversifying engagement. And I think that's for, for a few reasons. One, um, it's 
it's easy to have a public meeting and um, have people fill out a demographic survey and then you have that data and you can take back. Um, when you're trying to do more decentralized engagement and you're seeing people at a community event or certainly you can do it in a focus group, but if you're having outreach workers talking to um, you know, 15 different people at a park, um, we certainly can and we should be operationalizing that so we can capture that data. Um, right now, we don't have numbers. It's more qualitative. I can tell you how many, you know, approximately how many focus group participants they were and what communities they came from. Um, I obviously can't identify a, a lot of their identities for them without them telling me. So it's um, it's a challenge, but it's so important. And I, I think we, we're looking at a way to do that better. So that another way we can go back to the dominant culture and say, look, this is what we're who we're reaching out to, this is what they're saying. It is different from what you've been saying. And thus, this is why the decision is the way it is. Right, and, and just building on that, uh, Teva Needleman from Eco Districts asks, I'm not sure if I missed this, but how have your engagement strategies adapted throughout the pandemic? Yeah, so uh, I think like most people, um, we went remote. Um, we found that participation diversified. I think a lot of people found that um, by not requiring people to be in person somewhere, they could, you know, be on their phone or, um, you know, without video, um, you could get more people um, into a room and, and more diverse people. Um, but I think still the most effective way is, um, you know, knocking on doors, as I think, um, Kathy uh, Dalton mentioned, um, flyers, notifying people um, that surveys are available, um, going to parks and, and, and talking to parents, like that still is always going to my mind, trump um, any um, virtual or public meeting. Great, thanks, Melissa. And I think Johnny Shively gets the last question. Johnny, you always ask great questions. Uh, what are the limitations of community engagement in an era when gentrification and displacement are rampant? What happens if a mostly white community doesn't want to prioritize equity? Absolutely. I think that's kind of the, um, the crux of, of this presentation is what, what do we do if we're not hearing, like, if we're not hearing from people who um, are underserved and their voices aren't helping address problems that they're facing? then maybe it's part of the city's responsibility, like in the example of the affordable housing overlay and say, okay, it's no longer a discretionary permit. This is, we think this is a good thing that should happen, like we being city council, so it's still a democratic process, um, but the rules are changed and there's no longer this opportunity for this outsized um, unrepresentative group to influence it. And so I think in thinking through solutions to this problem, it's looking not only at how can we raise voices of people we don't hear, um, but also right size the voices of people we already hear. And, and by doing that, you might have to um, take away the microphone. Great. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. This has been really informative. I think you're probably going to get quite a few um, uh, emails from from students and uh, you know people looking for internships. Uh, next week we have Jessica Omakuti from uh, University of Oxford in England talking about climate action in the global south. Is net zero inclusive? So can we give a big UEP thanks to uh, to Melissa? Brilliant presentation, Melissa. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>